Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. I know that the back-to-back -back is a bit too much. Uh, would like to make it short. I will wrap up my lecture as much uh, as fast as I can, and then we can move on with uh, a break, and then we can come back to Dr. Here to the, listen to Dr. Roberts and uh, Dr. Eldip. So, as I, I mentioned in the beginning of the day, that we now trying to sh shift the focus from. Okay, this is how you put the nozzle prongs, and this is how the bubbler works, and check the circuits, and everything will be fine. We are moving a little bit to, to look, at, look at the overall global picture of what exactly a bubble CPAP program uh, should look like, and what are the essence and the elements of a successful program that actually lead to reduction in the coronal lung disease in your unit. Um, I have nothing to disclose in regard to this lecture. Um, so the idea is non-invasive respiratory management. We think we do it, and we will cause reduction in coronary lung disease. Uh, it's more than that. It is about how do you manage anemia? How do you manage oxygen? How do you feed? How do you manage residuals? How do you avoid neck? How do you manage PDA? Uh, how do you avoid IVH? All of these together will lead to an actual optimized outcomes, prevention of IVH that lead to uh, prolonged uh, uh, intubation and so on and so forth, reduction and so on, how to, the, to reach the point that actually your program will lead to improved survivability in, uh, in your unit with less mortality. So uh, Dr. Ahani Ali and myself, we got our own data from GW over the last uh, 20 years, and we put it together in a uh, a manuscript that we submitted for publication and was accepted as revision and will should be published soon. And in this, uh, we described 10 elements, what we call a bubble CPAP package of care. Uh, here, the first five of them relates to bubble CPAP. Okay, so how do you manage in the delivery room? And we'll talk about this tomorrow anyway. I wouldn't waste any time on this. How to use CPAP as early as possible, how to, uh, define criteria of CPAP failure and when to escalate intervention, how to manage airway, how to win off CPAP. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry, maybe this is not in your uh, uh, lectures. I will update the new ones. Uh, don't worry about it. Don't, don't have worry about uh, uh, writing down. You will have the actual lecture. Uh, in addition to how to give surfactant, when do you give surfactant, when not to need to give surfactant, how to manage with caffeine, oxygen saturation strategies, uh, fluid and nutrition management, and transfusion practices. I will focus more in this lecture about maybe the, the two or three elements here, which is what I call as adjunct therapy, or adjunct strategies to the bubble CPAP program itself. So few things we would like to work on in our unit to actually achieve a successful low mortality, low BBD, and, and better outcomes. One of them is the feeding protocol. And the idea is, going back, so, so this feeding management protocol it has actually many elements. It has to do with how do you feed, when do you feed, how to start, how to manage, how do you manage residuals. And all of these actually are maybe controversial. Some would say, you, you don't worry about residuals, don't even check on them. And like, but some say, we have to check on residuals and they, they are actually early clues for Nick. Whatever you think is better for you, you just have to have a consistent practices and that the whole team agree on and you, you implement them together. Mm -hmm. So the first feeding management here has three components. One is actually how to start an advanced feed. Uh, so we always start with trophic feeds as soon as possible. So the first element is start feeding even the day of life number zero. If your baby is stable, if the pH is more than 7.25, if the baby is not acidotic, if baby is on bubble CPAP, NIVBV, or intubated, if baby is stable, go ahead and start feeding. Don't, when I was resident, we would wait for 10 days, and when I was fellow, we would wait for five days. And now we will start to try to start in the, within the first couple of days. Start as soon as possible. Start in the first day of life, start slowly, but just prime the gut. 10 to 20 cc ml per kilogram uh, should be per day, not per hour. Uh, no advancement for 48 hours to 96 hours. The bigger ones, babies are more than 1,500 grams. Uh, a, a day or two, if they are fine, they have bowel movement, you start advancing. 
If they are smaller one, less than one kilo, maybe try to give them longer time until you achieve a good bowel movement and then you start advance. But start with 10 per kilo, go up to 20 per kilo, hold on until you, you are okay and then you start to advance. Uh, always, always listen to the baby, feel the baby, see bowel movement, use your eyes, see bowel movement, use your ears, hear bowel sounds and everything's fine, you start to advance. Be, be, like, sometimes it doesn't work, and baby, user, you put one cc, you get back two cc. You put one cc, you get back three cc. It's okay, just keep trying. What we do is, you put one cc, you start with one cc Q4 or one cc Q3, okay? And what will happen is, you get back one cc or two cc. Oh, you know, baby has feeding intolerance. This is day of life number one or two. There is no feeding intolerance here. Okay, just keep trying, just keep trying. So people actually, I come in the morning, my fellow put the baby NPO overnight because baby had feeding intolerance because he put one cc or two cc's and got back the same. And we have a different protocol I will talk about to, to manage, but it's after one week of life. So the first few days, Keep putting the 1cc. If you get 1cc back, that's okay. Discard it if you don't like it. Put it back if you like it, but keep feeding the baby. And then advance slowly, but steadily, 10 to 15 cc per kilogram. I'm sorry, it's per day, not per hour. Uh, fortify upon successful achieving 100 cc per kilogram per day. When I was a fellow, we were fortifying the milk, the breast milk, on the day of zero. So you start with fortified milk. And I don't know, whatever the practice that you, you do, like this, maybe this is not a very good idea because the milk fortifier, as of today, if you are not using uh, the prolacta, it's a cow breast milk, and if you are actually doing breast feeding or breast milk, either human, uh, either the maternal milk or donor milk, adding the cow's milk now is not a good idea, especially that it increases osmolarity. So the osmolarity of the breast milk is about 280 mL osmol, you, as soon as you add the HMF, it's 390 milliards more. So it, it, it's another stress that you will like. Now, the idea is there are different stresses that you work with the stomach. The dilation impact and the concentration impact. So you don't want to do both at the same time. You don't want to put hyperosmolar content. At the same time, you are stretching the stomach gradually. Okay? The, the, the size of the stomach of the baby is the size of the face of the baby. Okay? in the beginning, and then start to gradually dilate. So focus more on one of them, okay? We always try to dilate first until we hit about 100 cc per kilogram per day, and then we fortify to 22 calories, but don't advance that day. And then you give it after 24 hours, everything is fine, we advance until we hit 120 cc per kilogram per day. If you hit it, everything is fine, you fortify to 24 calories, but don't advance that day. And then everything is fine next day, you advance until you reach your target goal. So this is kind of the, the, the way that we figure out it will work fine most of the time. Do not fortify and advance in the, on the same day and use continuous, okay, when, so we, we use continuous transpedoric feeds with all the babies that are born at less than one kilo as soon as they hit 40 cc per kilogram per day. So you have a 500 grams baby. You started with one cc Q4, 1cc Q3, 2cc Q3, advancing gradually. As soon as you hit 40 per kilo per day, and baby is so small, uh, and what happened is because likely by day of four or five, this baby will be on bubble CPAP or in IVBV at this point. So try to avoid reflux and everything from putting large volumes in the stomach. We start to pass our transpedoric tube and divide it by 24 hours. So if we are on 4cc Q3, that means four times eight is 32. You start to divide this by, by 24 and you switch, you put your transpedoric tube and then you switch to 1.5 cc per hour. And this will continue like this until baby is at least one kilo or more and then you can gradually switch back to gastric feeds. This is the protocol that we have. We have it for every single like 50 gram. Like okay, a baby is 750, a baby 800, 850. How to start, how to advance gradually. This is a home meet. And we are publishing about it uh, uh, next year, uh, our, our out outcomes in reducing neck. However, you, you, can, you can borrow this, you can do your own, there is no magic about that, and there is nothing really peculiar. The whole idea is, we all as attendings, we sat down, we made this, we agree that this will all stick to. So whatever you come up with, just be sure that everyone is buying in and no one will come next morning and do something very different, okay? Just be consistent and agree on it as a team. And this is the most important thing in a cultural unit when you actually try to focus. Yes? Can I ask, sorry, the question with the COVID feedings? If, if I may, we can do all the questions by the end of the day? Yeah. 
so you make up your own, your own program, but stick to it as a team. Be sure that you are consistent and put a monitoring uh, officer where the uh, be, be, well, our, our colleague Biri Masabak in the back here, she is observing this as well as other team. And like we, 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 every time, every month, we look at how much did we actually adhere to our protocol to achieve the result by the end. Number two is residual management. So the number one was the standardized way of feeding as a team. Number two is residual. We came up with this Dr. Tatiana Nistrin, who was one of our attendings. She joined Dr. I now in, uh, in, in Cleveland. She came up with this, okay, how to identify bad residual versus good residuals or okay residuals. So the darker it is, the bad it is, and the lighter it is, it's okay. And then you, you, we check residuals before feeds. If you're doing Q4, we do Q4. If your care is Q3, we do it Q3. We check. If it is light, that means it is gastric juice, it's okay. If it's dark, okay, that's a bad sign. This is in addition to if you have large volumes. So, and we came up with this protocol, how to manage the residuals. If they are bilious and non-bilious, and if they are mild, which you mean like less than 25, less than 33%, what do with it? You, you do refeed. You may, you may hold the feed, feeding for one time and then you start. Maybe you, you hold for 12 hours. But the idea is we actually, in our institution, we take residuals seriously and it's volume dependent. If you put, if your baby now is three weeks old, you have 500 grams baby at birth, now three weeks old, likely the weight at this point maybe 650. And baby is feeding 13 cc per Q, per Q, Q3 and you find there's seven cc residual. This is concerning. This is more than 50% and you should take it seriously and we have a system to it. If it is three cc, that means it's maybe barely 25% and you can live with that and, and so on and so forth. Of course, you can challenge me, tell me what evidence that show you that 25% is not any dangerous than 50 or the other way around. And I don't have evidence, but like the common logic and the practice show that like when it's actually the residuals are consistently less than 25%, the babies are doing fine. But if it is more and more and until you hit 50% or more, they are not doing fine and something going on wrong. And you have to give them a break. Like me and you, sometimes when we feed, we had a good meal last day, yesterday. I don't want to really eat too much today, okay? But babies, we don't do this to them and they cannot tell us, please don't feed me. We just like the nurse come and she do what the way we order and they will put the, the syringe and run it, same volume, same, same, uh, same duration. And maybe actually we increase every day by one or two cc. Or without asking the baby, would you like to eat more today? Like, like, it doesn't matter, like, we just keep, give it, give it. So certain days the physiology is not the same and we really need to cope with that. So fluctuation and variability in residuals are okay as long as they are at lower minimum and as soon as they go beyond that, then we, we have to take it seriously and give them a break. Otherwise, what happens? Okay, baby has seven cc residuals, you put them back and feed full or you discard them and feed and feedful without any breaks and like give some time. That you should, that if there is some sort of minimal stress, like, like low vascularization, whatever happening that the blood flow is not great at this point, you just keep, keep increasing the stress and advancing the stress. Give them a break, they recover, they are fine, and then you start over again. Element number three is the osmolarity control, okay? We, I don't know what to practice in, in your institution, uh, we didn't have a, a policy or an idea. So what we did is we, uh, we would give sodium chloride, caffeine, uh, aldactazide, and vitamin D at nine o'clock in the morning. And we do it again at nine o'clock in the evening. So when we actually, okay, let's, is this actually a, a safe practice? So we look back and if you, in theory, calculate the osmolarity at, at that time, it's, it's huge. You add the milk, and you add vitamin D and caffeine and whatever, whatever, it's like, if you measure it, it might hit 1,000 or more. So when we looked at it, at it, we said like, you know what? What about if we actually try to distribute the osmolality across the clock? So not all of them come on the same time. So we developed this, again, it's arbitrary, okay? Vitamin D at nine o'clock. The sodium chloride, if you have any addition, at 12 and six. Uh, caffeine at certain time, and so on and so forth. So 
we, and we all stick to it. And we have it, every single baby will have this in the chart so that like we know that when should we give that? When there isn't, okay, I start caffeine, start to do this, they have to go there and they look at it and say, okay, I need to start caffeine at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. If it's vitamin D, it is different time. So I distribute, we distribute the medications across the, the day. So we don't have any specific os hyper or smaller time of the life of the baby. Uh, so these are the three elements that we put together, uh, the standardized feeding protocol uh, with the element I described, the uh, Z-Wells management protocol, and the uh, osmolarity management protocol that contribute to what we, we, we were trying to say, how this will add to the success of bubble C Babylon and invasive respiratory management in reducing neck and eventually improving mortality. The other uh, step number two is how to manage anemia. And the notion about the egg or the chicken, okay, does the anemia cause neck or the transfusion cause neck? And like, uh, we, we had the impression that the transfusion itself causing neck and the baby is needing transfusion, we shouldn't, if baby has like uh, evidence or, or science and symptoms of, of uh, intolerance and, and feeding uh, uh, intolerance. So, but by, by time, now, now it's, it's actually both. So some, sometimes the anemia, actually the hypoperfusion of the gut will be a major predisposing factor to uh, contribute to the predisposition of the gut to uh, neck. And if you transfuse in a way that is non-judges as well, it might add to that. So what we came up with is how to manage anemia and we came up with a protocol like that. Uh, baby, small babies less than one kilo, during their seven day of life, we would like their hematocrit to be at least 40. Or anyone else, regardless of the weight, that require more than 40% oxygen. Hematocrit should be 40. After first week of life, okay, we are okay with hematocrit of 35 or more for these babies. Like a baby uh, less than one kilo uh, at birth, but between the day of life number eight, like after the first week of life, all the way up to 32 weeks post ministerial age. Or anyone at age, any age that require more than 35% oxygen, uh, or more than 32 weeks, we still need CBAB, even if no oxygen. That is too much. And we are okay with 30 uh, hematocrit beyond that. And again, it's about uh, having a standardized way of managing anemia. And uh, all of us agree on it. And we have an officer that, like among us, one, one of our doctors, that actually audit us every month and give us star. So you, you get a, you get a uh, star if you are uh, uh, adherent to the protocol and if you're not, uh, and then you, you, get, you get like the finger, you did that. So uh, consistently we're doing this and we have been doing very well with that. The other issue is the uh, transfusion. So from one end, we are very strict about uh, how to manage hematocrit levels and anemia. From the other end, how to transfuse. And we come up also, this is kind of based on the uh, papers came from different places as well, as well as ours talking about, and Dr. Udeb with us was actually led that uh, early in, when he was with us 10 years ago, uh, how to, how would the transfusion itself disturb the perfusion of the gut and what the need for maybe NBO time. I, again, many of you here may be coming from different institutions and have controversy about that. Uh, but we have been doing this and have been working with us very well and we don't see a SNCC as we used to do uh, uh, the, in the previous years. So we give the baby NBO time, two hours before transfusion, during transfusion, whether it is three or four hours, and then four hours after transfusion. And then we start uh, fluid management during that to compensate for the time when there is no feeding. And when we restart feeds after four hours from NBO time, we will start only with 50% of the previous, if it was on full feeds, we start with 50% only for, for, for uh, one feed, if everything is fine. By the word everything is fine, I mean that the fellow is at the bedside or the attending, examining the baby, be sure that the baby had bowel sound, baby had bowel movement, if, if any, and be sure every baby is fine. And then you can advance to 75%, and then you advance eventually to 100%. So if we decide that baby will be transfused today, that means that, that we are not doing any advancement, and likely from the time we decide until baby is back to the, uh, where he was, uh, uh, feeding-wise, it will take almost 24 hours. Uh, okay.
So feeding management, anemia management, and pit and tux artery users. This is a very controversial topic. Uh, again, so it's, uh, all, of, all of what he said is controversial, but like it, and we have to talk about it because it somehow contributes to what we will say tomorrow. And we didn't do this in the previous year, and we said, like, actually, we need to share with you all the package that we do, and then you can pick and choose whatever you think is right for your institution. Uh, we don't like gate ducts. And the question is, like, is delayed closure of a BDA is an actual disease? We know it is happening in the premature babies, and it happened in some full-term babies, but we don't know if it's actual disease or not. And this is not kind of a trick question. We actually, we think it's a disease, but maybe it's not a disease, especially in premature babies where it mostly closes on its own later on. How can we figure out it's, if it is a disease? If it is not a disease, how, why do we treat it? And if it is a disease, what is the best way to handle it? Uh, in a baby that is mostly like, like less than 29 weeks, like 28 weeks and below, or 20, less than 28 weeks, they are going through many challenges on the same time. They are premature babies, they have RDS, respiratory insufficiency, feeding intolerance, they might get neck or neck-like episodes, they have apnea, they have anemia, prematurity, they have maybe IVH. There's too many things going on at the same time. And the better you are, and the more at the bedside you are, the less of these. But there are baseline they're going on. You go down to 26, you go down to 24, you go down to 22. Of course, more and more of this is happening to you and to the baby. So the more risk of these complications to occur, and independently, the more chance of a BDA to be present. So somehow, we will historically lead to the assumption that BDA causes or contribute to this problem somehow. So we, we see people talk about things between PDA and IVH. However, IVH happens, if it happens, it happens before PDA becomes significant anyway. We see a BDA, the BDA that becomes significant in two weeks, after, almost usually after, after it starts to show up at three to five days, five to seven days, but doesn't really become very significant until later in life. But we link it to early uh, pulmonary insufficiency. So over flooding of the lung, which is pulmonary phenomena, congested lung difficult to ventilate or extubate, congested pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, pulmonary hypertension. This was assumed that coming from a PDA. In addition, there were systemic phenomena, the, the metabolic acidosis that come with the hyperperfusion, gut hyperperfusion that f causing feeding intolerance, or sometimes we, co we correlate between PDA and neck. Renal insufficiency was claimed as well. So we as neonatologists and neonatal nurses and respiratory therapists engaged in the NICU, we are very keen that our baby has to have the best outcomes. And the idea is, okay, how can we differentiate? Why do we think that this happening is due to BDA versus not? And we really don't have a 100% evidence to lead us away. We, we, we correlated between these based on correlation studies, and we don't have any, any study that can say, can link the cause-effect relationship, okay? We have BDA and we have IVH, we have BDA and we have NIC, we have BDA and we have pulmonary uh, congestion, and we say, okay, they are together, they are linked together, they are correlated together, but we don't have an evidence to correlate, to, to draw the line between both of them. But most of us don't actually move into, like, the text, except, except in when there is a, a significant pulmonary insufficiency. Yeah, we see, like, when I was, junior attending back in 2003 and four and five. The, the fellow will call me. We have a fellow in house, we, we manage from house, and baby has ducts. Ah, now my heart starts to flutter. We have to start endomethacin. That means that I will have to follow up on the renal function, so I have to have Q6 or Q12 BMP to look at the B1 creatinine. I have to be ready with the platelet transfusion because the, 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 may, maybe the, the endomethacin will cause thrombocytopenia or inhibition of the uh, uh, the blatant effect, and, and, and maybe also it can cause IVH. So it's like just too much happening. So this kind of, of scare that comes with the, the, you hear about it and you start to, to, to treat it, is not really kind of justified based on a strong evidence. So the question is, did active closure of BDA help improve outcomes or not? This is the, uh, from Schmidt et al. back in 2006, looking at the impact of surgical ligation of BDA on every single uh, individual outcome, BPD, ROB, death, and so on and so forth, 
look here. So you see the B value is actually less than 0.05, but it, if you look at the numbers, surgery was always associated with bad outcome. More bronchopulmonary dysplasia, more ROP, more neurosensory impairment and 18 months of life, more cognitive delay. So surgical ligation, or actually, it would be diff wrong to say surgical ligation caused that. Okay. Surgical ligation happened in these babies because it was, we decided to treat these babies. Maybe others didn't tolerate the surgery and died before this, or they did fine without it. But it happened in those babies that ended up by having surgical ligation. Pinitz et al. in 2010, and all of you are familiar with that, and I'm just like re repeating this for those uh, uh, who know it already. He did this kind of meta-analysis for every single aspect of trying to ligate like, the duct. Like it surgically, medically, prophylactically, or rescue, using PO, using IV. The black lines are the ones that are showing significance, and the white ones are showing insignificance. So, if you look at all the combination, ligation, number A was kind of an actual surgical ligation, endomethacin PO, endomethacin IV for asymptomatic, meaning prophylactic, or uh, uh, IV for symptomatic, BO IV for symptomatic, whatever. Every single study is correlated with and actually it, the intervention, whatever it is, led to closure of the duct. But it didn't lead to any improvement in anything. So the black ones there say that the duct was closed. Whatever you do, the duct is closed. Great. But did we actually impact the outcome in any way? And the answer is most likely no in most of them. So Bennett came to the conclusion the available evidence indicate that later treatment of fewer infants produced better outcome, and this is only from that one over there. However, the time has come to accept the null hypothesis that treatment that close the persistent BDA in preterm infants do not improve long-term outcomes. Based on that, we decided, Dr. Ali and myself, back in 2010, we said, okay, fine, we are not going to treat any ducts. We just like, we don't hear, we don't see, we don't act. <laughs> it's not there and we will not do anything about it. So we did this kind of QI, project to test the hypothesis that conservative management of BDA, no medical or surgical intervention, will not impact outcomes among very low birth weight infant. We did the intervention, which was no intervention, nothing. Compared to the time before that, where we did like anyone else, we did endomethacin, we did ibuprofen, we did surgical ligation, and we did whatever it can. And I combined the data back in 2015 for the five years, from 2010 to 2014. And here it is, before and after, and showing that the chronic lung disease, so this was kind of the characteristic of the group, which is like treat, which is the 20, uh, 2001, 2009, no treat from 2010 to 2014. And the groups were similar in everything. There is no differences. B value is non-significant in all of them. And these are the outcome. Surgical survival to discharge without chronic lung disease. It was a little bit significant in the preference of no treatment. However, this was not the intent of the, the, uh, the analysis. CLD, no difference. Mortality alone, no difference. Pulmonary hemorrhage, no difference. Neck, IVH, BVL, ROB, no difference. So by totally ignoring PDA, we didn't see any difference in the outcome. And as of today, in 2019, we did not ligate or intend or try to ligate any duct since 2010. There was a little bit of non-significant increase in length of stay, but it was non-significant anyway, statistically. Uh, so this is as our intervention. So now, okay, the question is, is this because we are very liberal with non-invasive intervention in bubble CBAP? That's why we see that we don't need the, the, the closed duct? Maybe. Maybe is our BBD rate is less because the CBAP work fine in the context of that we don't treat PDA, 
Maybe. So we actually cannot tell is it the, which one is, 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 is right. But they are working together very well. We don't see that bad of a duct that you see for a, a prolonged intubated babies. And therefore, we don't, into, we don't end up by ligating them. And when we hear it, OK, the nurse will come to me and say, oh, baby had a very balancing pulses. He had a like, whooping murmur. I say, just fine. OK, just keep going on. We keep feeding. We keep managing. And we did not need to ligate anyone. To, to be completely clear about that, we had to transfer two babies out of the last 10 years to Children's Hospital for other reasons. And they were had duct ligation over there. Would they have it with, if they sit with us, maybe, not, maybe yes, I don't know. Uh, but out of, I, how, how many babies I mentioned? Uh, so it was 228 in 2015, so maybe now, maybe, and 450 babies, I'm aware of two or three babies that had duct ligation at Children's Hospital. But they didn't need it to us, and they were transferred for other reasons, not because of the BDA. Last thing we'll talk about, I have two minutes, is the ROP. And ROP is, again, is a reflection. We have very, very low ROP rates. And we didn't have any case that required intervention since 2010 as well. And it has nothing to do with the PDA uh, ligation uh, quality improvement project. But like, this is what we observed. The last time we did laser surgery was back in 2006. And the last time we did Avastin was in 2009. Uh, eight and nine, and we didn't have any uh, sentence. So this is our, our results for the whole sample. Uh, no ROB in 453 uh, cases, and any kind of ROB was 27%. Stage three and four was 5.9%. Only four of them had laser surgery, and this is back since 2002. And two cases had anti-VEGF therapy, and this was also in, in the years between eight and nine. And since 2010, we did not have any intervention. This is not only because of a very strong a B, uh, a, um, bubble CPAP program, but we are very strict about our auction management. We continuously titrate auction flow, targeting infant auction saturation between 87 and 93, targeting to the 90 to 93 range all the time. And like of everybody, all the attendings, all the nurses, everyone is actually very focused on that. So we, if the baby is, is desatting and the nurse will go up a little bit, everyone is working to be back. As soon as baby is back again to his normal range, you go back down so that baby is always, always setting between 90 and 93%. And we didn't have, as I mentioned, any cases of ligation. Uh, we have no time, so we'll stop now, we'll give you a break, and I will move this section to tomorrow's lecture. So thank you for listening today, and uh, we will have a break now, and uh, we should be starting with Dr. Uh, Roberts in, I think, in, in 30 minutes, I think. Can I see the... Uh